ಸರಸ್ವತಿಭ್ಯಂ ವಿದ್ಯಾರಂಭಂ ಕರಿಷ್ಯಾಮಿ ಸಿದ್ಧಿರ್ಭವತು ಮೇ ಸದಾ ಕೊರಿಯೋಗ್ರಫಿ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಡಾನ್ಸ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ದಟ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ಒನ್ಸ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಕೊರಿಯೋಗ್ರಫಿ ಅಂಡ್ ದ ಕೊರಿಯೋಗ್ರಫರ್ and to today's context i think the moment you say a choreographer the first thing that comes to your mind is film choreography and film item number so because uh, earlier i think uh, the choreographer even in a film was not so well known but today i think the dance choreographer has got a pride of place in a sense and you celebrate it and um, uh, there is lots of build up for the because the dance numbers so to speak or the item numbers have become very much important in a dance uh, that apart coming to classical dance the word choreography i don't think belongs to the indian vocabulary so to speak it's definitely a borrowed uh, phrase uh, because i have never heard as i was learning dance from great gurus so now that you are at the ma level and you have all gone through the marathon understood it imbibed it got the spirit of what the whole approach to bharatanatyam is which in itself is a huge learning in terms of understanding the tradition in its truest form as a reference point particularly in terms of the formats tala ripu jati swaram shabdam varnam padam javuli tillana kirtanam and of course in the end a kind of a normally in the traditional repertoire you end with a shloka which brings it back to a quiet stillness uh this whole thing is so rich in itself and so beautiful yet the essence of any classical form particularly in india is to be able to improvise and take the whole thing forward and make it your own in a sense you're not doing the work of a postman of picking a letter from here and giving it further what you are doing is learning a beautiful art form taking a handful from that beautiful river of creativity and then also giving back to the river as your own contribution to the river so that's how the flow becomes richer and that's how the flow continues because this is not a stagnant pool that you're talking about 
We are talking about a very vibrant flowing river. So to make it more vibrant, you have to bring in your energies, your creativity, your uh, contemporary sensibility also. Because dance at any given point of time is relevant only during that time for that period. So it, unless it in a sense uh, reflects how things are changing around you, it becomes so like a fossil. So in any classical dance form, what really makes it interesting is the fact that each artist brings his or her own individual statement to what is learned, what is created and that's how I think the whole uh, classical tradition is taken forward because you'll see that my guru would have taught it in, in a certain way to me, his gurus would have taught him in a certain way. So there is a, a certain progression that is taking place and you know the beautiful part is that my guru never told me that this is the only way to approach something. You know, they would always say that uh, this is how it is, this I have put together something and now it is your baby, see what you can, how you can play with it. So it's like giving you a whole set of skills and asking you to kind of, you know, work on it and put it together as you please, as you wish and as the certain composition demands. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, I remember very clearly my guru using the words Nayadu Setrike. Setrike means I put together something. And that brings me to the key thing of choreography. What really is this whole huge noise now about choreography and of copyright, you know. So, I think we come from a very anonymous culture. If you go to Khajuraho, none of those cultures have had signatures of the people who have created it. Or you go to Ajanta or any of these beautiful places where it's the, such, a, such a plethora of skill that you see there, but nobody is claiming it. Even the patron's name is not there. We come from that kind of a uh, totally. So, Guru's never said, this is my jati. He just always said, I put together something and see if it works for you or we can still kind of you know customize it or you are free to do whatever you want to do. So those were the kind of uh, 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 psych psychology that they had that uh, they would never say this. Of course they were very in a sense proud of being of a particular gharana or a particular style that they were proud of and after all what is a gharana? The individual genius of one artist which is so powerful and so wonderful that many people follow it. That's how a gharana comes about. Yeah. So, uh, if you say the gharana is something that is a watertight thing, it is not. It is something that one individual has so much of uh, creativity and uh, so much of geniusity in him that many people follow him and that's how it becomes a gharana then. Many of our gharanas of course are names after a village particularly or something like that, you know, Tanjavur style or Varugur style or Pandanalur style, these are names of villages and great teachers from there did a certain thing in a certain way and then those traditions got uh, expanded. So this whole system of uh, uh, gharanas, you know, is really the various teachers in various parts of Tamil Nadu creating their own work and they were a little chauvinistic about the, the, the material that their particular gurus taught them. Uh, but as time went by, you know, things uh, opened up a little more. Akka, um, today dance has moved out, it's become international. People, you were telling us that uh, these banis were village oriented. Now that people are moving out, what is the significance? How much have the gharanas maintained their identity in today's time? Uh, it's an interesting question. <clears throat> I think this has to do a little with the history of the dance in a sense. Because in the early 20th century, as you can see, that uh, when dance came to Chennai, in a sense, and when um, Kalakshetra was set up, I remember my own teacher being very, in a sense, threatened by this because she came from the Devadasi tradition. 
and um, she has uh, she had seen the whole transition of dance from temple to stage and i remember her making comments because i was a very young child i don't uh, kind of at that time i didn't realize i used to see her being very critical of things but i really didn't know why she was so critical now looking back it was a huge change where institutionalized teaching had come up and you know gurus had all come into the cities and a lot of dance was happening in cinema so there was a lot of things that all gurus were composing for cinema so there was so much happening around that there was a churning of sorts you know and and i think that's when the gharana slowly kind of in a sense opened up and uh, uh, it was not limited to because there was one, one student going and learning from two or three teachers so from you know different from different gharanas so then slowly what happened is that individuality of the dancer herself or himself started coming so i think that's when i think the slowly the opening up of styles i would say began because i remember my own teacher dandai the pani pille was teaching in kalakshetra singing in kalakshetra then coming out doing his own thing making dance uh, also relevant to cinema so he did a lot of things so he composed for dance compositions he composed so i feel lot of people like that moved out and did their own thing so i think that's when the gharana slowly today i feel it's really you can't see in a sense gharanas um, really making a statement the way they used to do. earlier you know when i used to go to chennai i used to always narrate this little story i used to go particularly to at least four concerts which were distinctly of gharanas mm. you know so i li- like to see that range and variety of seeing one varuvur style one pandanalur style one kalakshetra style one tanjavur style and everybody even would dress differently everybody would even go back differently walk differently the eye movements would be different there would be particular typical adavus done in that particular style so it would be interesting but today i see when i go to chennai it's one monochromatic kind of a uh, you know scene dance scene where everybody is chic everybody is uh, in a sense uh, the same way of wearing the flower the same way of wearing the dress it is not really in that sense that range one can't really see because it's become more dance has become more pro- professional so to speak uh, that's more how standardized. standardized and more i think the mm, people think themselves to be very professional in a certain way that is being professional is what the definition of being professional is Um, the again, it depends on the individual genius of a certain artist. If such somebody who is so, but you know, it's difficult simply because it's very personalized today. If you see, if you see, say Yamni Akka's style, it's her personal statement of the dance. You know, so though she learned from Kalakshetra, she had to do a lot of unlearning when when she went to Yalla Papilai. because his was totally related to music dance and music so he would even if he kept a hand like that it would be there would be musicality in the way he did a particular movement so he she herself i remember telling me she when she first class she said she says he used to say why are you pushing your hand gently keep your hand you know so i think she went through so much of training from so many different people that ultimately it was yamini style you know so i think you will see many of such people where but how much of it is she going to be able to transmit for it to become a a kind of a a, a style that can be carried forward is something very very um, difficult to say because you know she had a certain charisma and a style and a and a persona to carry off that style so i think there you will see many more of that kind where it's a personal statement so it it will be many such personal statements and not necessarily gharanas also because now hereditarily it's not passed on and it's absolutely and absolutely the gurus uh, the gurus are not there their children haven't taken it on the isavilar community is no longer there in a sense so it's only dancers performers teaching mm-hmm. 
so it's that kind of a, uh, a system now so i feel there is bound to be change now again coming back to how do you push the existing margam which you have learnt and how do you how does a student actually take the uh, step forward and make it your own or make it um, something that is bring something of you into the dance again coming back to choreography the word choreography it's come from outside it's not typically a word that is used i think i would prefer to use some rachana that's what i think uh, uh, actually says what we do in dance uh, because choreography literally means writing dance you know so we are not writing dance here you know literally that's what it means but it the connotation changed over a period of time it became putting together dance or assembling dance all these kinds of things but we don't do that and choreography necessarily i think in the west had a significance because it was group and essentially it meant assembling because there are multiple bodies so you assemble so you choreograph space visibly bodies but here it's a solo form you know so what does choreography then mean in in the indian context and how how i feel it's a very wrong a word in a sense you know it really doesn't um, uh, uh, bring out what we actually want to say and um, how we because there are so many elements in the dance that you need to really understand before you can because dance as you can see has poetry it has music it has melody it has rhythm it has yogic positions and postures that you take it has mythology it has the whole spiritual quality about it you have to understand that it has a cultural ethos that is also reflected because after all when you talk about bharatanatyam it has been nurtured in a particular state by a particular people so it has to reflect the regional flavor of that particular and the regional temperament of those people so i think so many diverse uh, uh, kind of uh, skills are used so just by saying choreography it really doesn't reflect the depth or the kind of uh, ingredients you that you're using you know in in um, actually putting together that's why sanrachana means a much wider word which brings in at least the idea that there are many elements that are being in a sense put in uh, to bring out the beauty of the dance and that's the basic thing is when you need to innovate is a very difficult different difficult word right now for you people i think in order to push the the first thing is to understand all these elements you have to have an in depth understanding of poetry of music of dance of rhythm of mythology i think all these elements unless they are thoroughly understood beyond the margam what is required for the margam is not good enough you have to learn more understand more go deeper into it go into every aspect of it in detail then you'll get little pearls of wisdom from each one of this which then sparks off other things that you put together and relate so choreography in a sense does not as i again it is i think come with the idea of writing about dance you know when people started writing which is again reviewing is a very recent kind of a thing in dance again teachers never liked this idea initially of reviewing a dance they would always say one has to enjoy the dance one has to kind of you know and they would never say you see a dance you actually experience a dance performance so you know the whole thing when it's when you needed to write you needed words so you know you just borrow it from the west and just use these words as and when uh, 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 how 
And the other thing about uh, uh, creativity and uh, pushing frontiers is that it cannot be done at a particular stage. Now that you finish your margam, now you start thinking about how you're going to innovate, how you're going to kind of uh, create a jati or create a pattern or create. In the pedagogy itself, it has to be built in. It is built in. Many times you don't realize that it is built in. And you structure it so much and you feel that a certain jati, unless I do it this way, uh, it is not going to be accepted. And it, it, it cannot be, uh, you know, you try to make it very, very uh, in a watertight compartment and say this is the only way to do it. And actually that is your own <laughs> filling in, you know. You need to also break out from that and see if it's a tisram, why not if, if, if it, it be done in another way. If you really understand the pacing and the spacing, what is required, how can you not. Also, I feel as a performer, over the years, one has danced in such different spaces. So the same jati, when you take it to different spaces and you see suddenly there's a huge space and you might have done a takita like this in the class, you need to use the, occupy the space. Then you go on stage and improvise. You suddenly do a takita, outward takita, simply because you need to occupy the space. So unless you're very, very clear about the rhythm, unless you're very clear about the breakup of each of these it's very difficult to improvise in pure dance. Improvising in pure dance requires a thorough understanding, a complete breakup, a complete, you know, anu, atom to atom understanding of uh, how the structure of the jati goes, how only then can you improvise and have the strength and presence of mind, even on stage, to play around with the jati. That's, that's I think, very, very an important key if you're becoming a performer and you have to see different spaces and react to it instantly. So that's one kind of improvisation where you have an existing uh, controlled parameters and within those parameters you push. The second thing is in pedagogy when I said, supposing there is there are certain structured adagus that you have and uh, you are kind of learning the basics and as you proceed and you, that's one thing we always need to remember that you constantly need to do adavu classes. Mm -hmm. I see many times what happens is uh, adavus are done initially and then you only come to the class and start doing pieces. Of course, this see as you go along the way you have to do your sadhana requires lot of mentoring. You have to do some amount of work to remember and sequence your pieces. You need to do some amount of work for stamina. You need to some amount of work for body preparedness. You need to do some amount of work to again as I said adavus so that you break it up and you see where the connections are and what are the elements that you can move and push and how much. So unless you do constantly the adavus, you are not able to then kind of give the visual patterns that you would like to. In a, uh, So I think uh, just coming to a class, um, starting your alaripu, then doing your next piece, and uh, that's not the way to practice, which uh, you know many, many times I think we tend to overlook that if it's uh, if it's just uh, uh, a program that you're rehearsing for, bas, wo items aage kar liya, and then namaskar karke you go. But that's that's exactly the typical way of staying within a round small area and not moving out. Mm -hmm. Moving out requires that ability. If it's a chatusram, in what all different ways is a certain other to be uh, uh, approached and to be to be visually to create variety and to also in in a sense be able to give it a emotional content you know so this is a very interesting kind of a subject and one can go on and on we will continue this discussion and take the, the specifics of how in pedagogy we take the dialogue forward 
in the next class.